In today's episode, we open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Oftentimes, when a congregation seeks a pastor, what is usually in focus is calling a man to perform certain duties. In particular, congregations want to know how well he will preach and teach and administer the sacraments. Other things like leadership and administration abilities, people skills, and likability also come into play. But in this part of St. Paul's letter to Timothy, he seems more concerned with the faith and character of the overseer or deacon who will be performing such noble tasks. Good morning and blessed Epiphany Tide. Today is February 14th and happy St. Valentine's Day. You're listening to Thy Strong Word. Each weekday morning, we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God speaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Please go visit them at lhfmissions.org, and you'll find out all the ways that they help congregations and missionaries spread the good news of Jesus with foreign language materials rooted in the Lutheran tradition. But this morning, helping us rightly divine our text, I'm pleased to welcome the Reverend John Lukomsky back to the program, Pastor Emeritus and co-host of Wrestling with the Basics, also on KFUO Radio. Good morning, Pastor Lukomsky. Welcome back to My Strong Word. Good morning, and happy Valentine's Day to you. (laughs) Yes, yes, and to you and yours also. How are things going uh, where you are? Oh, things are going uh, real well. Uh, we're we're getting excited about Lent starting up uh, uh, next week, and and I'm part of a Lent re- round uh, round robin if I can talk. Uh, so uh, you know, as a retired pastor, sometimes you find yourself sitting on the sidelines a lot. But I'm excited now to be able to actively participate in the. Uh, uh, Lenten worship that will be going on and preaching a few Sundays in the midst there. In fact, uh, one week I'll be preaching a Sunday and a Wednesday and another Sunday. And I think, well, man, I, I, I guess I'll have to go back into retirement when I get done. So <laughs> That's right. Well, the good thing about round robins, at least when I did them, is you only have to write one or two sermons because you're going to be get, preaching to a different congregation each time. So you get real good well, at it by the last time you preach it. <laughs> yeah, see, and, and last year when I was part of this group, that that's what it was. Uh, but now this year, there's only three of us doing it. And plus, they, they needed help on the Holy Week services. So I'm actually ended up writing three. I, I might even be writing <laughs> four. Well, yeah, I'm writing another sermon because I'm helping out my, my own pastor here. <laughs> At, at New Athens. So yeah, I didn't quite get the break that you're supposed to get on Round Robin, but I thought, well, these guys are all going to be preaching every Sunday, so I can do an extra sermon. That that won't be any harm for me. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Plus, we don't want we don't want you to get rusty. So yeah, you keep writing there those sermons and keep preaching them. <laughs> well, uh, brother, we got an interesting text today. We're going to be going through the qualifications for overseers and deacons. I think there's a lot to dig in in those two topics alone. And so we'll be spending a lot of time on those. Uh, Before we get into that, though, it probably would be prudent for us to begin with prayer. And I invite you to start us off with that. Oh, Lord, we uh, we thank you that that it is your way uh, to put men here on earth to serve your Christian church. And we pray that you open our hearts and minds to hear what it is you're looking for in the men that are called to serve in the office of ministry. Uh, And and we pray that all of those who are serving will hear this and will see this as a a guidance for them, and that it will also be for all congregations, that this is what they seek in their men. But again, primarily, Lord, we thank you that that's how you do it, that you send people out to preach the gospel uh, and to bring people to faith. In Jesus' name, we thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Well, yesterday's program ended with uh, District President Saunders from Iowa District East discussing with us 1 Timothy chapter 2. And 1 Timothy 2 ends with Paul's thoughts on the roles of women as it comes to exercising authority and teaching. And he says in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And then instead of just, you know, this is thus saith Paul, He gives the scriptural background for that. He speaks to Adam being formed first and then Eve. Uh, And then he talks about being saved through childbearing, which we didn't really get a chance to talk about too much yesterday. That's worth digging into. Probably not today, but uh, you at home, you should definitely do some research on that. Uh, But he ends the whole concept with uh, women, uh, as well as all Christians, continuing in faith, love, and holiness and self-control. And that's sort of the background 
that he's he's set as we go into this next thought where he talks about overseers. I'd like to go ahead and read the first seven verses, and then we'll we'll do what we want as we take it apart or reach back or whatever we want to do. But just to get us started, this is going to be 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 from the English Standard Version. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Okay, we have this verse, and he, he then will go right into deacons, but this is what we have first of all. Uh, where do you want to begin, brother? Probably, if I had to guess, probably with the office. I'm sorry, the uh, noble task. But I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you take it. And we'll, well, we'll, well, actually, I, I have a question to, to ask you that I, I was wrestling with, and, okay. and I think I have an answer. But but I don't know that there's a definitive answer. I, I find it interesting that that it, we have these two offices. We have the episcopus, which you're talking about here, translated overseer. Uh, we're going to have the diaconus, which is translated usually deacon. Uh, and we have the list of the qualifications for the people to fill these offices, but we have no idea what the offices are. <laughs> you know, usually when when you get a, a description of what you're looking for, you also get like a, a job description too. Well, what what is this person going to do? Uh, and now obviously to the people that he's writing to, they they know uh, these must be established positions. They must be fairly well known uh, through the Christian church at this time. But but we don't know. <laughs> and I'm wondering, well, so well, Paul, why didn't you tell us? What is it exactly an overseer is supposed to do? What exactly is a, a, a deacon is supposed to do? So do you have any thoughts on that? Why Paul doesn't actually give us a, a job description uh, of these two positions? Well, I lean toward your explanation, which is that these are already established roles in the church. So there really isn't a need for him to say, well, this is what an overseer does, because I think the people to whom he's writing would, they know what an overseer does, which is why at the top of the show, I kind of started off, you know, we always think of, well, here's all the things we need our pastor or clergy to do. But Paul isn't going into that. And I, I think, and again, it, it is not super clear. But I think it's because they they just know. They know what a presbyter is. They know what the episcopos is. They know what overseers or we might say bishops are uh, I th or deacons or or maybe elders, depending on how you translate it. They know what those things are. I do think it's important as we go through, though, that uh, and you can disagree. And I'm sure people out there will. But these roles here, while they speak to the qualifications for clergy today, they really are, I guess, maybe a, an early version of clergy before it became a little bit more uh, systematic, before we, we organized it in the way that we have. And, and clergy ranks, et cetera, have, have sort of shifted over the years to fulfill certain roles, all, of course, aiming towards the, towards the same goal. But, you know, it, it feels different, say, in a congregational polity church like the LCMS than it might in an Episcopal uh, polity church like the Episcopalians or the Roman Catholics. So I, I, I think that they just know. But I do think there are some correlations that we can learn from, obviously. Uh, but I don't know that there's 100 percent one to one. But I don't know. We'll have to look at it as we go through. Well, and, and uh, see, I, I agree with you completely. I, I wrestled with that for a while, and then it dawned on me uh, why Paul doesn't give us the specifics is, as you said, because the people he's writing to know the specifics. But but then again, that wouldn't prevent Paul from saying, well, the people that come after him might not know. So, But but, but that's exactly the point. Uh, see, our, our, our great error is we think if we could only capture uh, the design and the structure of the early Christian church, oh, then how much better our church would be today, ignoring the fact that 
there was no set structure. It depended on where you were at. It depended on what time of the church you were in. The church structure got more developed, as you uh, hinted at there, as as, as, as got older. Uh, and, and you need to remember that the early church had just as many, if not more, problems than we have. So perhaps the things they were doing, it's not something that we should necessarily <laughs> duplicate. And so I think that's why Paul intentionally leaves that up, because the need the deeds of a church in a different place, the needs of a church at a different time might not necessarily require an overseer or a, mm -hmm. a, a, a diaconess. Uh, now, but you're right. The principles behind all of this, of course, uh, see, see what, what occurred to me is, is there's no value in trying to figure out how the early church did things. The, the thing we need to do is listen to Jesus and what he tells us what a church has to do. And that we have to do. And then, as, as you hinted, you, you can have an Episcopalian structure. You can have the the, 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 the very uh, highly uh, set up structure of a Roman Catholic church. Or you can have the, the more congregational based uh, structure that we have. God doesn't care as long as, number one, you're baptizing. Because that's right. mandated. You can't be a church and not be doing baptism because that's what you're supposed to do. Make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have to have the Lord's Supper because it's what Jesus instituted, right? He says, take and eat, take and drink. So that, that's not an option. And, and, and what we're hitting at here is you certainly have to have the preaching of the word of God, right? Again, right. that's what Jesus commanded. Go out into the world preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins. So if you have those marks... Uh, and, and as Lutherans, I think we'd add the mark of the, the pronouncement of absolution. You know, what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Uh, um, and I, I, I suppose also the acts of mercy, because the Christian church is a church that loves the neighbor. Uh, if you've got those things, that, and then you can administer it however you think best. Uh, so anyway, that, that was my thought, that we, we don't need those details. They didn't need them because they already had these structures in place. We don't need them because that might not be the structure that we, we should follow. But it's what I said in the prayer. What this emphasizes, though, is it's always been God's way, God's means is sending people. That's how he does it. He, he sent Moses. He sent the prophets. Uh, he, he sent the apostles. He sent teachers. He sent pastors. Uh, and, of course, this is the ultimate uh, of God sending men as he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, right? So you got the parable where the, the master sends out the servants uh, and, and then he sends out his son. But that's, that's the pattern. Uh, God uses men to, to bring faith to men. Uh, and that's obviously the point that Paul's making here. Now, the question is, what kind of men do we want? Do we right. be doing that? And he answers that here. I do, you know, it, we do have established in the scriptures the concept of the office of holy ministry, and, and yes. there are these requirements for it. How that gets broken up, as we've discussed probably ad nauseum at this point, it's it just, <laughs> it's just changed. Well, it's just changed over time. Yeah, but, yeah. But with that said, with that said, you know, we, how am I trying to say this? You know, we often in the LCMS really get hung up on the idea that a pastor is a pastor is a pastor. We don't like the idea of ranks among pastors. Mm. Um, and I don't know. I think that that hang up probably goes back to some of our history, but I don't know that it's necessarily any more holy than a situation where there are ranks of pastors. So I'll give you an example. Um, when my friend, the previous host of this show, uh, was voted to be district president. I had said in an offhanded comment, oh, he was elevated to district president by his brothers or something to that effect. Oh, I got comments on saying the word elevated. <laughs> and it's like, humanly speaking, he has some supervisory responsibilities that your average Paris pastor doesn't have. What's wrong with acknowledging that, you know, we have men of different ranks? It's not saying he's any more holy, right? Uh, so, so I think that there's not a problem to have these structures. I think it's actually part of doing things in a good and decent order. But we in the LCMS, because of our desire to avoid, and I'm speaking very broad brushly here, but because of our desire to sort of avoid ranks or anything else, we get really hung up in some of the terminology. So we're going to be, even today, talking about terms like overseer, bishop, pastor, deacon. I'll sneak deaconess in there too. We have all these different roles, plus we have all kinds of other ministry type positions that we've come up with <laughs> with uh, directors of Christian education and others where we're trying just to get the work of Jesus done. But because I think we've not done a great job as a, as a 
church body to really define these things universally, there ends up being a lot of confusion. So you'll have like in the Southeastern District, lay deacons, and then you'll have elders in most all the Lutheran churches. But the elders in the Lutheran churches pretty much are like the deacons in the Baptist churches. And then you have elders and teaching elders in the Presbyterian churches, whereas we, our elders aren't clergy at all, but we have pastors and then we call our DPs bishops sometimes just to be nice, or we might call our vicarage supervisors our bishops. It becomes very convoluted, and I think that's actually not helpful. Uh, it's not really doing things in good and decent order, if I could be so bold. Well, and 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 see, I, I agree with you, because there's a, as you know, you and I have talked before, there are ditches on both sides of the road. Uh, so so the ditch on the one side of the road that says, well, organization doesn't matter. Uh, and of course, organization matters. The Bible emphasizes that, as, as you've been uh, alluding, do everything decently in order. So no, we don't want to just some kind of slipshod, shotgun kind of approach. Uh, organization is good because that's how it works here in the world. Uh, the ditch on the other side, though, is, is to say that, that uh, uh, oh, we have to have all this really highly structured thing, and without that, uh, the church won't function, because both of those ignore the fact that, that you have to have the Word of God, and it has to be done in, in a decent and orderly fashion. You can't have everybody claiming, oh, I'm, I'm the preacher, or you're the preacher. No, there, there needs to be organization, but, but it needs to focus on the fact that there's the Word of God. And, and if someone wants to, uh, and, and in fact, that was the thing, uh, you know why this is, uh, uh, Pastor Boo, because we came out of a structure where the bishops were saying, well, you guys can't preach the gospel, and if you do, we're going to take right. you out of your position. And so, well, we don't want that kind of structure, because we, we got to preach the gospel. Uh, um, but but no one ever said that we shouldn't have a pope. In fact, that's what really makes people uncomfortable. Luther had, had, had no problem recognizing the pope as a administrative head of the church. What, what he did have problem is recognizing the pope as someone who could speak with the same or perhaps even a superior authority than what the Holy Scripture said. He said, well, no, that, that we cannot abide by. Uh, but I agree with you. I, I don't see there's any harm in having the structure, and there's got to be some kind of structure, and we just all need to agree with what we're doing so we can be unified. Because uh, how are we going to be unified in doctrine if we can't even be unified in our, our earthly practice? Agreed with that. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we look at some of these, um, <clears throat> what do we say, characteristics, right? So he says the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. I think for the purpose of our discussion, we should see the office of overseer as it applies today, generally to speak of pastors, whether they be right. pastors with supervisory responsibilities, DP, circuit visitors, or just parish pastors, assistant pastors, however, pastor emeriti. We're just going to call, I think we just for the sake of conversation, we're going to say pastors. And I think that's typically how we've interpreted these. These, especially in this first section, are what we expect of pastors. And so, therefore, an over. Oh, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say, and see, I think that's a fair conclusion to make because if you look at the list of, of, of qualifications, the one thing that really sticks out between the office of the overseer and the office of the deacon is the overseer has to be able to teach. And there's nothing mentioned of that in terms of the deacon position, but it right. is certainly one of the things you have to have to be an overseer. Well, who does the teaching in the congregation? Uh, it, it is the pastor who does that, that, or at least in our structure, that's how it's done. And I, I guess in every structure, they have some way of appointing the person who's going to do the teaching. Uh, although now, now, now you've got another thing. I was thinking, what about the churches, <laughs> uh, Pastor Boo, who who just have a layman come up every week and 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 preach? See, now I feel really uncomfortable with that <laughs> that structure, because um, again, you don't have someone holding the office of ministry. It's just kind of be passed around amongst the lay people. Well, now I've got us off subject again. I'm sorry. Go but, back. But you know what? <laughs> what I actually you... want to, <clears throat> but I want to address that. It's not a whole lot yeah. different. Than the concept of the pop-up non-denominational church. So growing up down south, <clears throat> someone would just say, "Okay, I've been called to be a pastor," and people would be like, "Well, okay, I guess, I guess the Holy Spirit called him. What can we say?" Yeah. And then, de depending on which church you went to, because they did not align themselves with a particular confession or denomination, you would get a, a remarkably different teaching, no matter where you went. And so, even beyond denominational walls, that's not healthy for the public witness of Christ, for everybody to be so divided. At least with something like denominations, you can say, okay, well, this is their confession, and this is what I should expect from their teachers. 
And, and, you know, for us, for us as Lutherans, why that is really, really important is because we believe our pastors are doing something incredible, and that is they are speaking in the place of Jesus Christ. Now, now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that this stuff and you and I say here, that means it's the word of God. We're, we're not popes. <laughs> we're not speaking ex cathedra on thy strong word. And we do encourage everyone to do what the Bereans do, to get out your Bibles and see if there's any truth to what those crazy guys are saying. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I believe, and I tell my people that when I said to them, your sins are forgiven, that was what was Jesus Christ was saying. You know, that, that, that by his authority, I was saying that. And when I would give people the Lord's Supper and say, this is his body and blood, it wasn't because I said it. Oh, my goodness. No, I have no power to do that. But it was because it's what Christ said. And 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 when we preach the gospel again, what, what makes it uh, powerful that your sins are forgiven? Because John said it? Oh, believe you me, no, that. But because the Lord Jesus Christ had John say it. Uh, and, and that's why it's so important to us, because if a guy just steps up and says, well, I'm speaking for God, how do I know? I don't know you're speaking for God, <laughs> okay? Uh, whereas in our system, we know because it wasn't some man's decision to be the preacher, but he was called. He was called by the church. It was totally outside. You know, I studied. I, I put in eight years of study because I got an STM too. But that didn't make me a pastor when I was, it made me a, maybe a smart guy as far as the Bible's concerned. But I had no right to tell people that God had forgiven their sins until the congregation here at, at Trinity and, and at St. Paul said, we, we want a pastor. And we said, you're, they said, you're our pastor. And, and then, you see, there was an external authority that, that gave me the right to do those things. Oh, well, but see, other churches, they don't think their pastor has that authority. So I guess it really doesn't matter who does it then. But what a shame. Right. What a shame to, to miss out on this wonderful gift that Jesus Christ wants to give to us. I mean, really so. And I believe that because a pastor has the, uh, in the Greek, right, kalu ergu, they really drove that home for us oh, in yeah. pastoral ministry 101 back in seminary days. But because he desires a noble task, because he will have to stand in the place of Christ and speak for Christ, again, only according to what Christ has already declared. But still, yeah. you know, he's having to represent Christ. There are these standards, and the standards are uh, pretty intense, to be honest. And, uh, and I think we could talk at the end of me listing them how, well, maybe we really actually can't achieve all of these perfectly, which is kind of the point. But here we go. He must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, apt or able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, uh, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. So just starting at the top, um, above reproach, that's the first one that Paul lists, and it's probably the absolute hardest um, to, for, for any human to, to, to achieve. Well, and, and you know, the one thing we're going to see, this, this, this kind of theme uh, comes up over and over again in this list of qualifications. And, and, and Paul explains as we get to the end of this verses about the overseer, it's because the people out there are, are, are watching our pastors. And if our pastors are, are are jerks, or if they're 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 doing open sin, if they're they're somehow just not really good people, and it's what you said before, they're representing Christ. And then people are going to say, "Well, what kind of church is that? I don't want to be any part of that." So, so the fact that that we be above reproach is because of the the uh, you know the appearance we're giving before people, so that so they will not be offended at Jesus. See, that's the, that's the, the weight of the, the pastoral ministry, that people are going to look at me and, 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 and they're going to know I'm a sinner and, and they understand that. But, but if I'm doing these outward things, if I am violent, uh, if I am quarrelsome, if I'm a lover of money, well, that is not going to do anything good in terms of how people see the church. Uh, now we can argue, well, that's not fair. They shouldn't be judging the church mm -hmm. by the pastor, but that's how outsiders, as the word will be used later, that's what they do. So we're looking for a just, in fact, it occurred to me, most of these things are just being a decent pagan. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, above but reproach, gonna, I, I, you know, I was just going to say, I think it's important for people to know that above reproach doesn't also, also doesn't mean sinless. No, you know, no pastor no. is getting up there saying I'm sinless. And frankly, even to pretend to be sinless is not very helpful. As you said, you know, people are going to be offended at Christ because of his message. Less, you know, God forbid, literally, we 
uh, because of our behavior cause people to take offense at Christ. You know, it's already it's already enough that people are going to reject the message. Of course, some won't. But if we're not helping, well, we're not helping. Uh, and this and, in this next section, it says the husband of one wife. I just want to add those in too. the husband of one wife. You know, those poor single guys at the seminary. That must be why a lot of them tried to get married before they became <laughs> pastors, right? Because a lot of them were husbands of no wives, and that would disqualify them. Am I not reading that right? No, obviously you're not. But it did remind me that when I when I graduated <laughs> from college, I, I got married right away in the summer before I started seminary because I, I heard that cooking was terrible at the seminary. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't say for sure because I never ate there. I had a wife to fix my meals. <laughs> but no, and, and see, that's the other issue here too. By the way, it, does, it tickles me. What it literally says in the Greek is a one woman man. And I just right, like that because right. that's how I am. That's how you are. But of course, no, it isn't saying that you can't be a, a single man, of course, because Paul was single. We, we know that that isn't a requirement, uh, although it is a, to say that we, we don't want because, see, we forget that in these days there was a lot of people that there was polygamy. People had any number of wives, you know, uh, uh, and, and no, that isn't going to work. We, we need to have someone who is a one uh, woman man. And that goes along with everything else about being self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, Hospitable, by the way, I like that too because it literally means to be uh, welcome to strangers. That that's what it means, mm. uh, and and I like the violent too. I, so I like the words because there's these little poetic things. Violent means is to strike out, to hit somebody, to be a bully. Well, you know what? That that's not no. going to be good for a pastor. Uh, so. Well, and not a lover of money, he ends this list with. And I guess we could also be a little self-deprecating and say, yep, you don't want to be a pastor if you're a lover of money. <laughs> but in, in his case, though, there were situations where people were proclaiming either the gospel or a gospel that wasn't of God, but they really were doing it with the idea that they somehow were going to attain followers and prestige and, and wealth. And that continues today, unfortunately. Yeah, isn't that sad? Because that uh, oh, I just was watching a TV show, and of course it featured the pastor who had the Rolex and had the Mercedes Benz and everything, and 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 that oh yeah, that's what it's all about. Because you know, if you're a faithful Christian, then God is going to give you all these earthly blessings. And I thought, what a shame that that's the picture. But unfortunately, that's how people look at the church. Uh, but but well. This is why Paul's warning us that that cannot be. We 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 can't do these things. We we have a different standard. If you're gonna if you're gonna desire the noble task, okay. And I love the word desire there because it means to just want something as much as you can get it. And it's the word for coveting. Uh, it's actually the word for for sexual desire too. It could be used in that way, but it's that sense. It's something you've got to want with your full heart, and you can't want anything else. When you take the office, if you're going to the office for the love of money, if you're going to the office because you want to be the man in charge, no, no, you're, you're not a suitable candidate because because the only one we're looking for here is all they want to do is just come and bring people God's love and forgiveness. That's and when I was a minister, that's all I wanted to do is just make sure that people understood that Christ loved them and that even if they were sinners like me, that Christ forgave them. And and I, I'm glad you brought that up about because, see, that's that's not being the man that is described here, if you get up there and say, well, I don't, I'm, I'm the perfect person. And and I think people respect it when, when we are able to say, no, no, I have my flaws and my sins and I, I don't want to do these things. And, and if I'm doing them, please point them out to me and God help me that I can correct wherever I'm doing wrong. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think that's what impresses the, the, the outsider when they say, oh, here's not a guy who's parading around like he's perfect. But he he's got the same struggles I've got. Th this church right. might be worth talking to, you know, listen to what they have to say if, if they're like me and, and dealing with all the things that I have to do with, which I know are not the way I should be dealing with things. There is always a balance. You know, they told us way back at St. Louis that in your sermons, for instance, you never want to be the villain or the hero of your own yeah. sermons. But at the same time, and one thing as we go into break, I want us to think about is it begins if anyone aspires to the office, he, and as you pointed out, desires a noble task. Um, you know, there are some thoughts that one should not aspire to the office as if wanting to do it in and of itself is some sort of sin. You've made the clear distinction. It's wanting to do it for the wrong reasons, which rises to that level of not being uh, eligible for the office. But uh, as we go to break, 
I want the folks at home to think about it. You know, if there is a young man in your life that's interested in pastoral ministry and he desires that, encourage it and, and hang out with us. We'll talk about it when we get back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boom. With me today is the Reverend John Lakomsky, Pastor Emeritus and co-host of Wrestling with the Basics, also on KFUO Radio. Folks, if you have any questions or comments about today's show, as always, I just want to encourage you, reach out to me. My email is pastorboo, P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E, at gmail.com. Or you can drop me a message on Facebook. I love hearing from you. Well, Pastor, before the break, I had kind of brought up this idea of if anyone aspires to the office, he desires a noble task. This is what the apostle is saying. And sometimes I think we get the idea that you have to be sort of invited into this brotherhood, because if you inspire, if you aspire to it for the wrong reasons, it's certainly a sin. But there's also absolutely nothing wrong with someone saying, I I." I feel like I would be a good candidate for this, and I'd like to be trained and formed for pastoral ministry. In fact, we need more of that. What do you think? Yeah, and, and again, that's the very definition of the word aspires. Uh, it means to reach out for something, to to, to want something. Uh, of course, the thing is, is just wanting it doesn't make you that. Like you said, right. that there there is training involved, uh, that there is a call, there is an ordination. Uh, I remember when I started seminary, uh, the, the president of the seminary said, you know, John, uh, there was a farmer. He, he came into the seminary and he said, you know what, I, I, I want to be a pastor. And, and well, why? Why do you want to be a pastor? Well, I was plowing and I looked up and I saw in the clouds, I saw the letters PC, preach Christ. And, and, and the wise old professor said, how do you know it didn't say plant corn? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. I, 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 oh, man, here's the thing that you got me thinking about. If there is anybody listening to us or if there's anybody that knows some young men out there uh, that, that would be good as ministers, do do encourage them. We mm -hmm. we need pastors. It's just what Jesus said in the Bible: that the harvest is plentiful. Pray to the Lord of the harvest uh, for laborers, and we we are desperately in need of pastors right now. And it's a great job. I I, I would not have traded my forty years in the ministry for anything. It, it's a frustrating job. It's a difficult job, and yet I, I don't think you'll find a job that has the the richness and the rewards and the strengthening of your faith that goes in being the ministry. Uh, and that's the thing. God grant us some people that want it, and then let's get them the, the knowledge and the, the understanding uh, of the doctrine that they need. And then let's declare them, yes, this is a pastor, so that there's no doubt in their mind. Because, see, that's the thing. Now you got me thinking, too, about why it's important to not just say, well, I'm going to be a pastor. Why it's important mm -hmm. that the church says, that the church ordains you, the church calls you. Because sometimes as a pastor, you wonder. Sometimes you, you do have right. failures. Sometimes things go wrong. Well, maybe I shouldn't have been a pastor. But for me, it was always a comfort. And, well, I didn't make that choice. It's what I wanted. But but I didn't I didn't choose it on my own. I, I was the one that was called. The, the, the church said that I was doing this. And so Christ said that I'm doing this. All right. So now I can go back at it again, knowing it wasn't my decision, but it was actually the call of God. And that's a great comfort in our structure uh, for our pastors. And I don't really know in structures where they don't have that. I don't know what the pastors, how, how they can find that kind of confidence. But well, uh, anyway, go ahead. Well, there's one, at least one more thing I want to talk about before we move on to deacons. And that is verse four and five, where Paul says, 
he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Or if someone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Um, this is this is a tough one because as pastors, as with absolutely anybody else, there can be family turmoil. There can be disobedient children. There can be um, unfaithful spouses. There can be any any kind of variety of family dysfunction that happens in any other household can also happen within the household of the pastor. And yet here we have managing one's household well as a standard by which you know they're held to in terms of uh, pastoral ministry. What do you think about that? I mean, how do, how do, how do we figure that one out? Well, you know, I, I'm really glad that you asked that because I, you know I, I went through this text and, and looked at the the Greek and all of that, and I always like it when I learn something, and, and, and this was the thing that I learned that I never realized before. Uh, the Greek word that's translated "manage" there, and, and I'm not denying that that's one of the meanings of the word is "manage," but when you look it up in the dictionary, you'll find uh, another meaning of that word is to have concern for. And it occurred to me, yeah, that's what you want to know. You want to know whether you got a good guy to be your pastor? Ask yourself, how does he treat his children? How does he treat his wife? Does he show that he has concern for his household? Well, then that's probably the guy you want, because if he has concern for his household, then he's probably going to have concern for God's church as well. Uh, um, in fact, I found an interesting thing that the, the Greek word for dignity there. Let, let me let me give you a, a couple of examples of people who were considered dignified by the Greeks. One, one, one was a high priest by the name of Anarus, and this is what was said of him. A venerable and just man who, despite his noble birth, his dignity and his honors, loved to treat the humblest as his equals. Now that's from the Jewish historian Josephus. So you see, dignity doesn't mean someone that's aloof and cold, but actually just the opposite. For the Greeks, dignity is someone who was humble, someone who had concern and, and treated people as his equals. In fact, here's another epitaph uh, from someone who was dignified. Uh, this is on his tombstone. Uh, Revered, admired, worthy to be loved by all. Uh, and, and when you hear those things, you read that, oh, we're not talking about someone who likes to boss people around. That's not what we're talking about. Somebody, oh, you kids, you better do this. You better do it now. Uh, but we're talking about someone who has a real honest concern for his family, which, of course, that does involve disciplining your children, doesn't it? Because that's what God said. I, I discipline you. Why? Because a father disciplines his son that he loves. But but it does kind of put a different twist on it, doesn't it? When, when you're not thinking about the guy who could just make his kids do whatever he wants them to do. Uh, and I would suggest that's that's wrapped up in the word submissive too. Submissive isn't just getting people to snap at your command. Uh, submissive is getting people to want to do what it is that you've asked them to do. Uh, um, and I could go on a long discussion on the word submissive because I think Paul takes what was a very common uh, Greek term. The Greek philosophers talk about people submitting all the time, and they and they meant it that way. They meant that you better do what your boss tells you to do, what the Lord, what the king tells you to do. But then you got Paul, and he says, you know, wives should submit to their husbands. And the Greeks would say, oh, yes, absolutely, Paul. And then Paul said, you know, husbands should love their wives as Christ. And that would have shut them up because they never thought of that, uh, that the wife would do what I told you to do. But to think that I might be giving up everything for my wife, see, no, no Greek philosopher would ever have suggested that was the way to live. So, so anyway, I, I'm glad you brought it up because I think that's the point. You're looking for a pastor who really, really cares for his wife for his children. And then, you know, that you know they're going to care for the church too. I'm glad you brought that up too because prostenai, which is that word you're talking about for manage anyway, yeah, it has the connotation of helping, um being there for, and as you said, having concern for. So if you if you think of that, then even when things go awry, it's not as though you weren't strict enough or you didn't, you know, keep the reins tight enough. Uh, it really matters on whether or not you still care and are concerned and are eager to help. And, and st you know, so I think there are a lot of just guys out there who maybe even think, well, I, I don't feel like I always have it together. So therefore I'll never meet these standards. Hmm. Well, don't forget pastors get forgiveness too. <laughs> and so, yes. you know, these are standards to uh, aspire to just like the office. Um, not ones to just be able to stand up and say, Oh yeah, of course I'm all those things because then we're now we're in a, a, an area of pride, which would be not good either. 
Well, which is which is exactly the next verse, isn't it? That he'd be puffed up with conceit. So maybe that's precise. Right. But thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Pastor Boo. Maybe that's the whole point of these requirements, that we look at them and say, oh, my God, I'm not that. And then Paul would say, great, because we don't want you being <laughs> conceited. We want you to be humble and now go and do the work that Christ has given you to do. So it may actually yeah. be the intent of part of this, that we would all confess that we're none of us can live up to these standards. But... As you said, we are forgiven and we are the ones he's put in that office. And so uh, and, and I know, Pastor, there's always that tension because we don't want to say, well, then go out and just right. live however you want to live. No, no, obviously not. <laughs> you know, that's what they said to Paul. So you mean we should sin more? So grace may abound. Oh, God, <laughs> help us. No. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I do think you're right. I think this is far. And, and I, I there's one thing I want to say before everything that's here especially the terms the overseer. Now we'll do the term deacon. They're the words that are used of Jesus. He was right. the overseer. He was the servant. In fact, remember what he said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many, which of course, every pastor knows, thank God that he gave his life as, as a ransom for me. Cause, cause if anyone needs that, we pastors certainly do. Well, let's, let's, let's lump the deacons in here too. We're going to read verses eight through 13. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. A lot of the same themes here for deacons, minus that uh, teaching role. Now, I got a question for you, though. See, because you're right, it, it, the, the requirements are pretty much the same, other than the fact no teaching. But did you also notice that for the deacons, the wives become a big thing? Uh, for the overseers, there's no really description of what the wife should be like, but it goes rather lengthy. The wives also need to be dignified, not slanderous, sober-minded. Why, why do you think that is? Why, why, if you're a deacon, all of a sudden, what kind of wife you have becomes a very, very important issue? Well, that's the that's the twenty five thousand dollar question, right? What are they? Yeah, what yeah. is Paul talking about when he says uh, "gunaikas," which is the Greek word here used, and is not actually wives, but is the women? So yep, the yep. question really is a couple, uh, a couple fold, right? Are we talking about those married to the deacons, that is just their wives, or are we talking about deaconesses, that is women who are fulfilling these um, diaconal functions, or are we talking about the wives of deacons who would have sort of been by default deaconesses? Uh, and they're sort of husband wife teams, or is it a big combination of the, of the three. And and I don't know that it's super clear. In fact, I think if it were super clear, we would, uh, we would have a little bit more clarity in the roles that we want to have in our church body, which I, you know, lamented a little bit earlier. So I think we see deacon being just used as servant. And so when it brings in the wives, I tend to lean towards the idea that, um, it's not, I, I don't know that I like the, the definition wives. I think it's more about the women who are serving also in these servant roles. But I'm, I'm happy to be influenced. What do you think? Well, you know what? <laughs> when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, why don't, Why in the Bible don't you have a word for wife and a word for woman? But as you said, it's, it's no the same. It's the same word. And you have to just go by the context. And I'm thinking, truly, there might, but but as far as I can see, it, well, I, I, I not as far as I know for a fact, in the Bible, at least, there isn't any specific word for husband or wife. It's it's man and woman. And you just kind of figure it out. And like you said, that's the problem here. Are you talking about women deaconesses? Are you talking about the, the women are married to the deacons? And and as, you're absolutely right, Pastor Boo. Who, who knows? Who knows? I, I, I do think the one thing that I was reflecting on is, is what you had mentioned before, that Paul has been really, really clear about that, that, that the role of the teacher, it, it needs to be the man. He doesn't allow women to teach. And, and so that makes sense. Then when he's talking about overseers, he's not going to go into anything about about the women uh, or the wives, because, no, by definition, that they will not hold that office. Uh, but here, apparently, as you said, apparently, yeah, uh, either they can hold the 
office or, or whatever their husbands are going to do. And they're going to be part of that, too. They're going to be very, very visible, very public in terms of their actions. So then the same obligations and requirements uh, of the husband would be required of the wife. Or again, if we have a male deacon, the same requirements would be of, of a, a woman uh, deacon. And and the argument in, in behalf of that, that we're, we're having a, 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 a woman's office of deacon is we have women deacons, right? We got, we got Phoebe. What is that in the, the in Romans or what book is that, that it mentions her as a, you know, uh, being a deacon. So, yeah, I, I, as you say, we, we don't know for sure, but we certainly do know that, that there is this office in the church that, that a woman can hold and it's a very appropriate office, but it's not a teaching office. Because uh, I suppose we should have clarified that from the beginning that the word uh, deaconess is is our deacon is one who serves. Uh, that's that's the word for service. Uh, actually, literally means waiting on tables. Uh, and some people think it goes all the way back to that story in Acts where you know uh, the apostle said, you know, we we've got things to do. We can't be taking all the the money and the food and taking care of the widows and stuff. We need to appoint some people to do that. And you get Stephen and six other guys who we never remember who their names are, <laughs> but they You're they right. obviously were people that were important that they got appointed. So, um, so anyway, it it here's I'll throw out one more thing. You know, sure. we, we get criticized in the LCMS because we do not have women pastors, okay? Uh, uh, and it's becoming less and less that church bodies are not having women pastors. But what always I thought remarkable, and I don't know if it's still true today, but when you looked at the professional church workers, we had more women professional church workers than any other uh, uh, church body had. So isn't that ironic <laughs> that for the church that said, no, we want male pastors, men pastors, uh, we were also the church then that had so many uh, women working full time in the church as well, either as teachers, teachers or deaconesses, or you said directors of Christian education or whatever uh, office they had. I'm not sure how the statistics hold, but my guess is because of our clear teaching of the doctrine of vocation. Because if you have some of these church bodies whereby their pastors or their overseers or however you want to define their clergy class, so to speak, if they consider themselves high over and above their parishioners, not servants to them, not there on behalf of Christ, but there for their own gain, all the things that Paul says for them not to be, yeah. if you look at the role of pastor and think that's that's some high office, then if you're a woman, you're going to be very upset that you're excluded from it. And if you're a regular parishioner, you're going to be upset that you are like a second class citizen. But if you're in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and you go, the pastor, while important and certainly called by God, um, is but one vocation by which all of God's work gets done. And, and before God and for the purposes of the church, these things have equal weight. We need people to uh, do the the diaconal work as much as we need people to proclaim the gospel. All of these things are part and parcel, and one is not uh, to be more prestigious than the other. And I think that our our wise teaching of that helps those who are looking to serve the church not believe, well, the only way I could really serve is be a pastor, and I can't be a pastor because of whatever reason. I, I think that might be part of it. Yeah, and I agree with you. And, and see, that that—, that... Again, it, it gets to be this whole thing. Are you looking for glory? Are you looking to be the boss? Are you looking to be the head? Well, let me tell you right away, you're not even coming at it from a Christian standpoint because Christ is taught repeatedly. You want to be first. You need to be last. You want to be great. You should be servant of all. So going back to the thing, if you desire to be a pastor, that's what you aspire to. Please understand you're not going to be the big Lord of Lords. You're going to be the one who will be called to get up in the middle of the night. You'll be called to do all kinds of humble service and you will love every minute of it. <laughs> right. Cause you're knowing you're just doing what God has given you to do. And I think that's the joy for the women who work in the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod too. They're very, I know my wife, she was a full-time church worker. Uh, she had a teaching degree. She served most of the time as a principal and, and, uh, and, and, and you know what? See, here's the thing. I would have been a horrible principal because I, I think, as you've gathered, am, am, am pretty much a softy. <laughs> OK, <laughs> but 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 the no, principal needs to be someone who's able to be very structured, very organized. And when a kid comes in, you know, she can't just say, oh, Johnny, that's OK. No, she has to 
apply discipline in a very appropriate fashion. And my wife, she she did that, and she did that very well. So again, it's it's not a matter of whose strength, who's who's greater. Is as you said, it's just we're all serving the same Lord Jesus Christ. So. Absolutely. And folks, if you want to find out who's running your local congregation, uh, head down to the kitchen, not to the pastor's office. <laughs> so I do want to get the last verses of our of our chapter in. It's just 14, 15 and 16. Here we go. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. And then he says, He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in the world, taken up in glory. The ESV editors name this last little paragraph the mystery of godliness, but he's giving this as sort of a, just in case I don't see you as soon as I want to, this is what we confess what is he confessing here? Well, and see what I think is really neat about this is, as you've said, uh, you know, he gives you all these lists of requirements and anybody who's honest would say, I don't know. I, I don't know that I can fulfill all those requirements. And I, I think it's him saying, yeah, we understand that. That's how it is for all of us as Christians. Nobody gets into the Christian church because we are qualified. <laughs> OK, uh, what was the old Mark, uh, Groucho Marx joke? I wouldn't want to belong to an organization that would accept me as a member. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And and, and, and to say, say, of course it is. So it's always been about Christ. That's how we got into the church. That's how we remain in the church. That's how we will end up in eternity is because of this Christ. And then he just goes to everything, like you said, that we believe about Jesus Christ, that he was manifested in the flesh, right? That, that's the key thing about Jesus. So God sends men into the world, but the greatest thing he did is he sent his own son to become a man into the world. That's how he brings his love to people. Vindicated by the Spirit. I, I, one of the, the, the Lutheran commentaries I had had a list of all the times the Spirit gets involved in the life of Jesus. And I thought, wow, I never thought about that. So the Spirit is there at his conception. The, the Spirit is there at his birth. The Spirit is there at his baptism. The Spirit is there at his temptation. Uh, you know, you just go, the Spirit is there in his resurrection. Uh, and, and so it's, isn't that cool? So even Jesus doesn't vindicate himself. Even Jesus doesn't step up and say, well, I'm Jesus. You need No. <laughs> just like I as a man doesn't come through, well, I'm the pastor. No, no. He, you got to be vindicated by, by the Spirit. Uh, and, and the church does that. That's how I know that I'm a pastor, because the, the, the Spirit through the church that I was a pastor, and even Jesus gets that way, vindicated by the Spirit. Seen by angels, of course. Again, the angels are all the big things at his birth, at his resurrection. Proclaimed among the nations, of course, that's what Paul's talking about. That's what the church exists for, to make disciples of all nations. And it's working it's working, Paul says. People all over the world are believing. And of course, we know that he was taken up into heaven and he will return to judge uh, the living and the dead. So you're right. It's just uh, they, they think it was a hymn. It sounds like a hymn. I don't know. I, I don't know how the manuscripts look, but of course, in the in the English Bible, it looks like a, a poem of some kind. Uh, but that this is the pillar and buttress, uh, the church. But the church is nothing except uh, that it is the church of Jesus Christ. Amen to that, brother, and I think that's a good place to end. Folks, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend John Lekomsky, Pastor Emeritus and co-host of Wrestling with the Basics on KFUO Radio. Pastor, your show is on Saturdays at what time? At 9 o'clock, and it's always available on, on the website or on your favorite podcast app. <laughs> so That's right. Ed, download that KFUO app, folks. It's, you can hear all of our programs and it's, a, it's such a great resource. Thanks again, Pastor, for being on the show. Thank you, Pastor Boo. Tomorrow, we're going to keep going with Paul's letter. And in the next chapter, he levels with Timothy. He says, well, something that we all know too well, that in the later times, some will depart from the faith. They'll be chasing after deceitful spirits, the teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. We see that coming true day by day. But of course, so did Timothy, and so did the Christians of the first century. We're going to talk about that, and also how he encourages Timothy to stay faithful and endure the suffering that comes from ministering to a world that rejects Christ. All of these things we will talk about when we come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. 
Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word. Thank <laughs> you.